In today's video, I'm going to be finishing my wall piece. I'll briefly cover making the sleeve and refer you to a video on making the lath. I'm going to make holes in my quilt and I'm going to do those in a couple different ways. And finally, some beading. So our first topic is the sleeve and to do it I like to cut it six inches wide and so that it's approximately an inch shorter than the width of the quilt. And then what I do is I press narrow hems into both ends by folding the fabric over twice and then I press a long fold. Then I take it to the machine and first I stitch the hems and then I, with right sides together, stitch a quarter inch seam down the length of the sleeve, matching the ends carefully. And then I turn that, either just with my fingers or using some sort of implement. Then I press it so that I can stitch both sides of the sleeve. And see how that offset makes it so that I have room for my laugh to be inside there. The side that has the seam allowance, I stitch it 3 8 a little bit more than the quarter inch so that it just sort of buries those raw edges. And then I stitch the fold side with my edger foot at just about an eighth of an inch. And this makes it easier for me to sew it on straight. I want it to be straight and follow the shape of the stick so that the wall hanging will hang without buckling. And so you can see how my lath that I have here fits right inside there. And it'll go on like this. And this stick is a little bit long. It was actually made for another quilt. These are two older videos. One covers the quilt sleeve for irregular bindings. And then the other covers how my husband makes the lath. In the video on the sleeve, I show how I'd like to draw a very straight line actually following the stick. And then I pin to that and I carefully stitch down that edge. And then once that's done, I pin the whole thing flat um, so that the bottom of it is flat even though the top has the extra fullness. And then I stitch the sides down and I stitch the bottom down. So this is what the back of the quilt will look like when it's hanging. So this is what we want to do. We want to put a hole in the quilt and we want to turn the fabric to the back and then sew it down so that it's finished off. And I suppose you could do a raw edge on the back. I just, I don't know. I, I don't do the raw edges. I hope you can tell that I don't truly do the raw edges out of laziness. I do them as a, as a design choice. And so I want the back of the quilt to be finished off. I'm looking at maybe here and here, and then maybe one here, and then all the way over here. And I'm gonna show you two ways to do it. One where you just slap it down, stitch it, turn it, and then hand stitch it. And the other one where we're gonna cut our hole and we're gonna stuff the neighboring area, and then we're going to stitch the fabric on, and then we're gonna turn it and and take care of it that way. Let's do the easy one first. So I'm using my backing fabric and I'm not worried too much about which way the grain goes. And I might make four, even though I said three earlier. This is um, an area where I'm gonna put one and I don't really care that it, it doesn't need to stay inside this. But if I do it sort of in this neighborhood, it'll have these stitching lines on the sides. And so I've got one pin so that I don't slip around too much up there. Like I wouldn't want to come onto my leaf by accident. And so I'm just going to put a couple pins. If free motion quilting with pins is uh, problematic to you, you could do anything that was okay with you, including actual basting. I'm just gonna do tiny stitches to go around, and then I'm gonna go around a second time 
You could do this with a small stitch and a regular foot and just turn your piece, but if you're experienced at free motioning, it's easiest to just free motion it twice. And you don't have to be exactly in the same spot, but you don't want to be in a completely different spot when you come through for the second pass. So let's see how this goes. So what I'm going to do is I've got this folded so I won't cut through my stitches anywhere and I'm just going to do one good snip to get all the way through. And then, and I suppose if you mess that up, you'd have to make your hole bigger. Kind of hard to just start chopping into your quilt. You want to cut this pretty tight, but you can go a little closer than you would. I'm just trying to clean this out. And I do want to kind of clip into the point. Not all the way into it, but pretty darn close. I'm going to clip up here. This is a lot smaller hole than I did on my larger quilt. And that point needs to be. Now we might end up coming back and clipping a little bit more, but I kind of doubt it. I think we're going to be able to have this turn through. So what I'm going to do is push this through and I'll push out into all the little areas of it. So you have to wrestle with this a little bit, but if you're patient you can coax this into submission. Turn the steam off on your iron and once you have everything under the iron, you can blast it with a little bit of steam. Once you get it nice and flat, which may include a few little buckles at the points, Trim it off so that it's about three quarters of an inch and then turn the edges under and press them. And along the way just keep checking to make sure that you've got the right amount of fabric pulled to the back of the quilt. And when you're hand sewing you can be very careful to make sure that you have that the way that you want it. It can look really neat to have a lot showing on the front but then you'll have more buckling on the back and so you just want to manage those layers so that you like them. It can really add to a design to let the fabric do what it wants and turn that into something that is really appealing to the eyes. This is a picture of what the next one's going to look like. The only difference is that we cut a little bit of a hole first that makes an access point to a nearby area that's a big void in the stitching. And we can stuff that with a little bit of stuffing to add a trapunto element. And then what we'll do is we'll just make our hole in the exact same way, except it will cut away the little hole that we made, and so it will close the quilt up successfully. Then I don't want to get too full because it's going to go down to the hem, and I don't want to cause my hem to buckle. So it's right sides together, and I can come pretty far up here. So I'm going to. I'm going to give myself a spot that I can come up there to by taking this, but I need the pin on the other side. So I'm going to take and just pin this through to the other side. And I don't want to stitch all the way to that, and I also need enough to turn here. So I might, I might move this just a little. Give myself a little bit more room, okay? And then I need to stitch down to there. I want to kind of give myself a guide. See how I can see my I can see my pedal right there. So I'm pretty comfortable with that. You also could use flat pieces of batting and stuff those into the place. You could even stabilize the stuffing in the area with a few hand stitches when you do your hand sewing. But the main purpose of this element in this video is to get you thinking about ways to add dimension to your art quilts. I recommend playing with various techniques and just seeing what works and what you like and what you can do if you really push it. After all my hand sewing, mine looks like this on the back. Here they are close up. You know, this is a little small for me to work and these don't look as good as they would have even five years ago. But, um, and I wouldn't normally do work this small, but I think it's acceptable for a quilt bag. Everybody has their own tolerances and, and you decide if this needs to be a lot neater on the back for you. 
Here my piece is on the front. I put it on my white table so that you can see the surface showing through. It doesn't bother me that there aren't any holes up where the sleeve is, but that might bother someone. It seems like a good time to mention that I have painted my leaves already. I did the veins with metallic rust and then dabbed some of that and some violet on my leaves. And then I covered that over, blending it with some metallic citrine. I liked the leaves before, but they were kind of stark. And then with just the veins painted, they were a little too striking. And so I sought to mellow them a little. I did like them. I was tempted to leave them with just the veining. This extreme close-up is intended to show the metallic quality the paints add, which is difficult to show with photographs. I don't know why I want all these things to sparkle, but I guess I do. I've always said that these quilts are finished when I like them. And I like this, so I wouldn't necessarily beat this. And I don't want to do beading that's going to get lost on my flowers. And so what I'm planning to do is bead on my egg yolks, and then I will scatter a few beads around and I will just show you that at the end when it's done. And I'll put a, once I'm completely done, which might be a, a little while, even though the video series is gonna end today, I'm gonna put a big picture on the website and I'll also do a post that includes everything, uh, links to all the videos and any extra information that, that I think of that didn't make it into the videos. Okay. There are only a few things that I wanted to be sure and show you, and one is that when you start, you can pop your knot into your fabric. And so here I just give myself a little bit of length and I poke through there. And so I've got this like this, and I'm going to pull my knot, and I've got a double knot there. And sometimes your thread will break, but if you just take this and then you just pull, it's just going to be stuck in there, and it's stuck in batting, so it's not going to come anywhere near this hole. So that's really well buried in there. Another thing to remember is to try to tie a double knot every five or six beads. So now I've got five, and so I'm going to tie a double knot. And once I come with my next bead, what I'm going to do is go a little ways away, the width of the bead, and I try to find a fairly good sized bead because these are all a little different. And with tiny beads I would use a single thread. These are a pretty good size. And so I'm going to go through here. You see that little knot right there? I'm just going to pull him into the bead and then he's kind of hidden. The only other thing I want to show you is that you want to use pliers sometimes to pull through and this isn't a particularly hard thing but sometimes it's really hard and you can use your pliers not only to pull through but also to kind of push through uh, certain areas so that you don't stab yourself trying to do it and so you'll also want to use a thimble. I wanted to also make sure and tell you the things I keep in my beading box. I've covered this before, but I wanted to make sure and mention this stuff. Besides beads, I keep a dull pair of my embroidery scissors, needles, thread heaven, Nymo thread, which is what I prefer to use because it's very strong, but it's limited in color. You actually can get any color, but I only buy the ones that I can find locally. At least so far, that's all I've ever done. I have a rectangle of Velux, like from a blanket, those that are fuzzy. And that, you can put your beads on there and they don't roll around. And it's easier to keep track of the individual beads with something like that. I have uh, needle nose pliers and thimbles, and a bead spinner. And I have a thing called a beam and reed, which is a light that you wear around your neck. And I use that often when I'm beading in a location that isn't well lit and doesn't have a good lamp next to it. I prefer to bead in direct sunlight, but um, 
that's not practical all the time. I keep a pair of cheaters in there. My uh, eye doctor said that I beat the curve by 10 years, but at this point I really need some cheaters to even want to beat. I could probably do it, but it's a headache and it wouldn't be as neat because I wouldn't see little mistakes that I was making. And when I say that if I like something, then it's done, the feeling that I'm trying to resolve is that feeling of this needs something. It just needs a little something and so I'll work to resolve that. And sometimes that part will happen a month later once you feel a piece is finished but something's still bothering you and then you come back and finish it later. I'm really tempted to sort of encrust the leaves with some kind of bead and so if I do that that will show up in the post on the website later because I'm not going to hold this video for that while I mull that over and then do the work if I'm going to do it. A big part of this process for me is just a matter of saying what if I did this? I wonder if this would work. I wonder if this would be cool. And I want you to understand if you come from quilting or if you haven't done much sewing at all, much of what I do with fabric comes from garment sewing. It comes from that understanding that I got in high school making garments. I only know of one subscriber that's actually done that and she did tons and she she's the one that made the zebra that I recently posted on Facebook and she's just doing the coolest coolest stuff. With this wall quilting, the order you do things is really important and if I were going to actually follow through with the satin stitching on my background, I probably should have done it before doing my sleeve. I just wanted to jump in and get to the business of this video and so I did my sleeve first. I've often done satin stitching on the wall quilts after the sleeves are on. I also wanted to mention that I may be gone until after Easter, after this video, between taxes and spring cleaning and the yard starting to wake up, I want to take some personal time to get caught up on some things and help my mom with some things that have been piling up.